Okay, welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage of VMware Explore 22, formerly VMworld. We've been here since 2010 in VMworld 2010 to now it's 2022 and it's VMware Explorer. We're here with the CEO, Raghur Raghuram. Welcome back to theCUBE. Great to see you in person. Yeah, great well, to be here in person. <laughs> Dave and I are, are proud um, to say that we've been to 12 straight years of covering VMware's annual Thank conference. You. And Thank you. we've seen the change and the growth and over time. And you know, it's kind of, I won't say pinch me moment, but it's more of a moment of, there's the VMware that's grown into the cloud after your famous deal with Andy Jassy in 2016. We've been watching what has been a real sea change in VMware since taking that legacy core business and straightening out the cloud strategy in 2016. And then since then, an acceleration of, of cloud native-like direction under your leadership uh, at VMware. Now you're the CEO. Mm -hmm. Take us through that because this is where we are right now. We are here at the pinnacle of VMware 2.0 or cloud native VMware as you point out on your keynote. Take us through that history real quick because I think it's important to know that you've been the architect of a lot of this change and it's, it's working. Yeah, definitely. We're super excited because like you said, it's working. Uh, the history is pretty simple. I mean, we tried um, running our own cloud, Cloud Air, vCloud Air, didn't work so well, right? And then at that time, customers really gave us strong feedback that the hybrid they wanted was us and Amazon together, right? And so that's what we went back and did and the Andy Jassy announcement, et cetera. And then subsequently, um, as we were continue to build that out, I mean, once that happened, we were able to go work with uh, uh, Satya and Microsoft and others to get the thing built out all over. Then the next question was, okay, hey, that's great for the workloads that are running on vSphere. What's the story for workloads that are going to be cloud native and benefit a lot from being cloud native? So that's when we went the Tanzu route and the Kubernetes route. We did a couple of acquisitions and then we started, uh, that has started paying off now with the Tanzu portfolio. And last um, but not the least is once customers have this distributed portfolio now, right, increasingly everything is becoming multi-cloud. How do you manage and connect and secure? So that's what you start seeing that. You saw the management announcement, networking and security and everything else is cooking and you'll see yeah. more stuff there. You know, we've been talking about super cloud, which is kind of like a multi-cloud on steroids, kind of a little bit different, yeah. repivot of it, and we're seeing some use cases. No, no, it's a, it's a very great, it's, a, it's pretty close to what we talk about. Awesome, I mean, and we're seeing this kind of alignment in the industry, it's kind of open. But I have to ask you, when did you have the moment where you said multi-cloud is the game changer moment? When did you have, because you guys had hybrid, which is really early as well. When was the ragu, when did you have the moment where you said, hey, multi-cloud is what's happening, that's, uh, we're doubling down on that, go. I mean, if you think about uh, the evolution of the cloud players, right? Microsoft really started picking up mm -hmm. around the 2018 time frame. I mean, I'm talking about Azure, right? In a big way, yeah. In a big way, right? When that happened, and then Google got really serious, it became pretty clear that this was going to be looking more like the old database market than yeah. it yeah. looked like a single player cloud market, right? Equally sticky, but very strong players, all with lots of IP creation capability. So that's when we said, okay, from a supplier side, this is going to become multi. And from a customer side, that has always been their desire, right? Which is, hey, I don't want to get locked into anybody. I want to do multiple things. And the cloud vendors also started leveraging their on-prem. Microsoft said, hey, if you're a Windows customer, your licensing is going to be better off if you go to Azure, right? Oracle did the same thing. So it just became very clear. I am, um, I have John make you laugh. I always go back to the software mainframe because I, I think <laughs> you were here, right? I yeah. mean, you're, you're almost 20 years in. Yeah. And I, the reason I appreciate that is because well, that's technically very challenging. How do you make virtualization overhead virtually yeah. non-existent? How do you run any workload? Yep. How do you recover from yep. failure? I mean, that's, that was yep. not trivial. Yep. Okay, so what's the technical you know, analog today, the real technical challenge when you think about cross-cloud services? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a different for each of these layers, mm -hmm. right? So as I was alluding to for management, I mean, you can go each one of them by themselves. There is one way of doing multi-cloud, which is multiple clouds, right? You could say, look, I'm going to build a great product for AWS, and then I'm going to build a great product for Azure. I'm going to build a great product for Google. 
That's not what ARIA is. ARIA is a true multi-cloud, which means it pulls data in from multiple places, right? So there are two or three, there are three things that ARIA has done that I think is super interesting. One is they're not trying to take all the data and bring it in. They're trying to federate the data sources. And secondly, they're doing it in real time. Mm -hmm. And they're able to construct this graph of a customer's cloud resources, right? So to keep the graph constructed and pulling data, federating data, I think that's a very interesting concept. The second thing that, uh, like I said, is it's a real time because in the cloud, a container might come and go like that. Like that is a second technical challenge. The third, it's not as much a technical challenge, but I really like what they have done for the interface. They've used GraphQL. Right. So it's not about, if you remember, in the old world, people talk about single pane of glass, et cetera. No, this is nothing to do with pane of glass. This is a data model that's a graph and a query language that's suited for that. So you can literally think of whatever you want to write, you can write and express it in GraphQL and pull all sorts of management applications. You can say, hey, I can look at costs, I can look at metrics, I can look at whatever it is. It's not five different types of applications, it's one. That's what I think, and to do it at scale is the other problem. And, and the the technical enable there is just it's good software. It's a protocol. It's a no, no. It's 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 software. It's a data model, and it's the federation architecture that they've got, which is open. Right, you can pull in data from Datadog just as well as from you pretty can much pull anything. In data from VR ops. We don't care. Right. Yeah, yeah. So Rego, I have to ask you. I'm glad you like the super cloud because you know we we think multi cloud still early, but coming yeah. fast. I mean, everyone has multiple clouds, but spanning, yeah, this yeah. idea of spanning across has interesting sequences. Do you yeah. do data, do you do computer both, and yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of good things happening, Kubernetes has been containers, all that good stuff. Okay, how do you see the first rev of multi-cloud evolving? Like, is it, what happens, what's the sequence, what's the order of operations from a client standpoint, customer standpoint of, of multi-cloud or super cloud? Because we think, we're seeing it as a refactoring of something, uh, like Snowflake, they're a database, they're a data warehouse on the cloud, they, they say data cloud, they'd, they'd, like, they'd tell us, no, you're, we're, not a data, we're not a data warehouse, we're a data cloud. Okay, you're a data warehouse refactored for the CapEx from Amazon and cooler, newer things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a behavior change, yeah. but it's still a data warehouse. Yeah. How do you see this multi-cloud environment refactoring? Is there something that you see that might be different that's the same, if you know what I'm saying? Like, what's, what, what's the, ne the new thing that's happening with multi-cloud that's different than just saying, I'm, I'm doing SaaS on the cloud. Yeah, so um, I would say, I would point to a, a couple of things that are different. Firstly, my, the answer depends on which category you're in. Mm -hmm. Like the category that Snowflake is in is very different than Kubernetes <laughs> or something. Or right? MongoDB, right? Yeah, or MongoDB. So, so it is a, a, not appropriate to talk about one multi-cloud approach across data and compute mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So I'll talk about the spaces that we play in, right? So step one for most customers is two application architectures, right? A cloud native architecture and an enterprise native architecture and tying that together, either through data or through networks or through et cetera. So that's where most of the customers are, right? And then I would say step two is to bring these things together in a more, uh, uh, a closer fashion, and that's where we are going. Mm -hmm. And that is why you saw the Cloud Universal mm -hmm. announcement, that's why you've seen the Tanzu announcement, et cetera. So it's really the, step one was two distinct clouds that is just two separate islands. So the other thing that, that's Dave, really what the other thing that I'd like to get your reaction on, because this is great, um, you're like a master class in the cube yeah, here, totally. um, <laughs> is we see customers becoming super clouds because they're getting the benefit of, yeah. of VMware, AWS, and so if I'm like a media company or an uh, insurance company, if I have scale, if I continue to invest in, in cloud native development, I do all these things, I'm going to have a da data scale advantage possibly, agile, which means I can build apps and functionality yeah. very quick yeah. for customers. I might become my own cloud within the vertical. Exactly. And so I could then service other people in the insurance vertical if I'm the insurance company with my technology and create a separate power curve that never existed before, because yeah. the CapEx is off the table, it's operating expense yep. that runs into the income statement. Yep. 
this is a fundamental business model shift and an advantage of this kind of scenario. Yep. And that's why I don't think so, Snowflake's What's your reaction to that? Because that's something that, that is not really talked, it's highly nuanced and situational, but if Goldman Sachs builds the biggest cloud on the planet for financial service for their own benefit, why wouldn't they? Exactly. So and they're going to build mean, it, They, they right? sort of hinted at it that when they were up on stage on the AWS, right. right? That is just their first big step. I'm pretty sure over time they would be using other clouds. Think well, about they it already are on-prem. Yeah, on-prem right? too, they're yeah, using, exactly. Right? exactly. They're, they're using VMware technology <laughs> right, there, right? I mean, think about it. AWS, I don't know how many billions of dollars they're spending on mm -hmm. AWS R&D. Microsoft's doing the same thing. Google's doing the same thing. We are doing not as much as them, but, but we're doing our own share. Yeah. If you are a CIO, you would be insane not to take advantage of all of this IP that's getting created. And say, look, I'm just going to bet on one, doesn't make any sense, right? So that's what you're seeing, and then yeah. Yeah, the, I think that the really smart companies like you talked about would say, look, I will do something for my industry that uses these underlying clouds as the substrate, but encapsulates my IP and my operating model that I then offer to other partners. Yeah. And their incentive for differentiation is scale yeah. and capability, and yeah. that's a super cloud. That's a or, or would we say IT environment? <laughs> yeah, but this is why. This is I why mean, I'm saying it seems like the same okay. game. But this is why. I'm well, I mean, I think uh, IT environment is different than. Well, I mean, cloud, IT but, advantage but, to help the business. But, in the old okay, days, you had some services. You, you, know, you said but Snowflake's data warehouse. You guys are the marketing guys, so you <laughs> probably no, yeah, whatever. But yeah. you said Snowflake's data warehouse. See, I don't think it's a, a okay. data warehouse. It's not that's a data like, warehouse. That's like saying, okay. you know, I VMware's a virtualization company, or ServiceNow is a help desk tool. I agree. This is the change that's occurring, and that you're enabling. So take the Goldman Sachs example. They're going to run on-prem, they're going to yeah. use your infrastructure to do self-serve, they're going to build on uh, AWS CapEx, they're going to go across clouds, and they're going to need some multi-cloud services, and that's exactly. your opportunity. Exactly, that's, that's really, when you, in the keynote I talked about Cloud Universal, right? Mm -hmm. So think of a future where we can go to a customer and say, Mr. Customer, buy 1,000 cores, 100,000 cores, whatever, capacity. You can use it any which way you want, on any application platform, right? And it could be on-prem, it could be in the cloud, in the cloud of their choice, in multiple clouds. And this yeah. thing can be fungible and they can tie it to the right services. If they like SageMaker, they could tie <laughs> it to Sage, or Aurora, they yeah. could tie it to Aurora, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's really the foundation that we are setting. Well, I, I mean, you're building a cloud across yeah. clouds. I mean, that's the way I look well, at it. And, it, and that's why, it's a, to, to me, the, the DPU announcement, the Project Monterey coming to fruition is so important. Yeah. Because yeah. if you don't have that, if you're not on that new silicon curve, yeah. you're going to be left behind. Oh, well, absolutely. You know, it not, allows us to do things that you would not otherwise be able yeah. to do. Not to pat ourselves on the back, Raghu, but we, in what, 2013, Dave, we said... Feel free, we, go ahead. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we said with Lou Tucker when OpenStack was crashing yeah, yeah. and then Kubernetes was just yeah. a paper. We said, this could be the interoperability layer. Yeah, you got and it. And you could have interclouding, because there was inter no, inter yeah. inter I was going <laughs> to riff on internetworking. Yeah. If you, but if you remember internetworking yeah, during yeah. the OSI model, yeah, yeah. TCP and IP were hardened after the physical data link layer was taken care of. So that enabled an entire new industry that was open, open interconnect, right? So we were saying interclouding. So what you're kind of getting at with cross cloud is, you're kind of creating this routing model, if you will, not necessarily routing, but like connection, interclouding, yeah. we yeah. called it, I think. I mean, it's kind of a terrible name, of, but. What you said about Kubernetes is super critical. Mm. It is turning out to be the infrastructure API. So long it has been an infrastructure API for a certain cluster, right? But if you think about what uh, we said about vSphere 8, with vSphere 8, Kubernetes becomes the data center API now. We sort of glossed over the point of the keynote, but you can do VM operations, storage, anything that you can do on vSphere, you can do it using a Kubernetes API. Yeah. And of course, you can do all the containers and the Kubernetes clusters and et cetera, what you could always do. Now you could do that on a VMware environment on-prem, you could do that on EKS. Now Kubernetes has become the standard 
programming model for infrastructure across. It was the great equalizer. Yeah. You, we used to say Amazon turned the data center into an API. It turns, it turns into like a lot of APIs and a lot oh, of complexity. Yeah. Right, and Kubernetes changed well, the, the game. Well, the role of de facto standards played a lot into the TCP IP revolution before it yeah. became a standard standard. What the question, Raghu, as you look at, we had Submit on earlier, we had Vittorio on as well. What's the disruptive enabler from a De facto, what in your mind, what should, because Kubernetes became kind of de facto, even though it was in the CNCF and in open source, open, it wasn't really standard standards, no like standards body, but what de facto thing has to happen in your mind's eye around making inter-clouding or connecting clouds in a, in a way that's going to ex create extensibility and growth? What do you see as a de facto thing that the industry should rally around? Obviously Kubernetes is one, is there something else um, that you see that's important for, in an open way that the industry can discuss and, and get behind? Yeah, I mean, there are things like identity, right, which are pretty critical. Um, there is uh, uh, connectivity and networking. So these are all things that the industry can rally around, right? And um, that goes along with any modern application infrastructure. So I would say those are the building blocks um, that need to happen. On the data yeah. side, of course, there are so many choices as well, so. How yeah. about, uh, you know, security, I think about, you know, when after Stuxnet, the, the whole industry said, hey, we have to do a better job of collaborating, and then, when you said identity, it just sort of struck me. But then a lot of people tried to sort of monetize private reporting and things like that. So you, do you see a movement within the technology industry to do a better job of collaborating to, to solve the acute you know, security problems? Yeah, I think the customer pressure mm. and government pressure, right, causes that, right? Yeah. Even now, even in our current universe, you see there is a lot of behind the scenes collaboration amongst the security teams of all of the tech companies that uh, is not widely seen or known, right? For example, my CISO knows the AWS CISO or the Microsoft CISO and they all talk and they share the right information about vulnerability attacks and so on and so forth. So there's already a certain amount of collaboration that's happening and that'll only increase. Do, do you, you know, I was somewhat surprised I didn't hear a more in your face about security. Is that just because you had such a strong multi-cloud message that you wanted to get, a, get across? Because your security story is very strong and deep. Um, when you get into the DPU side of things, the, you know, the separation of resources and the encryption and, and all end to end. Um, no, we have like, a phenomenal security yeah, story. Yeah, almost we have like a phenomenal tell the security story. story. And uh, yes, I mean, so I'll so plead guilty to the fact that in the keynote you have so much yeah, 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 uh, sure. uh, time. But what we are doing with NSX, and you will hear about uh, some NSX projects um, as you, if you have time to uh, go to some of the sessions, yeah. there's one called Project Notchar, and the other is called Project Watchman, or Watch, I think it's called. They're all dealing with this. That is going to strengthen the security story even more. Yeah. Uh, we think security so and data is going to be a big part of it. Um, Raghu, as CEO, I have to ask you now that you're the CEO, first of all, we'd love to talk about product with you because you're yeah, yeah. It was just a great conversation. We want to kind of read the tea leaves and ask pointed questions because we're putting the puzzle together in real time here with the audience. But as CEO now, you have um, a lot of discussions around the business. You got yep. the Broadcom thing happening, yep. you got the rename here, yep. you got multi cloud, all good stuff happening. Dave and I were chatting before we came on this morning around the marketplace around financial valuations and EBITDA numbers. When you have so much strategic goodwill and investment in the oven right now with the, with, um, the investments in cloud native, multi year investments on a trajectory, you got economies of scale there. It's just now coming out to be harvest and more behind it. Yeah. As you come into the Broadcom and or the new world, the wave that's coming, how do you talk about that value? Because you can't really put a number on it yet because there's no customers um, on it. I mean, some customers, but you can't, probably some for form, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. it's yeah. not like sales numbers. Yeah, yeah. How do you make the argument to the PE type folks out there like EBITDA and then all the strategic value? What's the, What's the conversation like? If you can share any, I know it's obviously a public company, all the things going down, but like, how do you talk about strategic value to numbers, folks? Yeah, I mean, we are not talking to PE guys at all, right? I mean, the only conversation we have is helping in Broadcom with yeah, the Yeah, yeah, but the number, planning. people who are looking at the number EBITDA, kind of. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised if, uh, for example, even with Broadcom, they look at the business holistically as what are the prospects of this business becoming a franchise that is durable, 
and can drive a lot of value, right? So that's how they look at it holistically. It's not a numbers-driven company. They do, they look at that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a misperception to say, hey, it's a numbers-driven conversation. Okay. It's a business-driven conversation where, I mean, and Hawk has been public about it. He says, look, I look at businesses, can they be a leaders in their market? Yeah. Because leaders get, to, as we all know, a disproportionate share mm -hmm. of the economic value. Is it a durable franchise that's going to last 10 years or more, right? Obviously, with technology changes in between, but uh, 10 years or more. Well, you got your internal and, VMware uh, talent, customers and, uh, and partners. Yeah, significant competitive advantage. So that's that's really where the conversation starts, and yeah. the numbers fall out of it. Got it, okay. I so think there's a track record, too, that, culture. that, that VMware has. You've always that had an culture. engineering culture that's turned you know, ideas and problems into products that that have been very successful. Well, they had yeah. different engineering cultures. They're chips, you guys are software, right? You guys know yeah, software. Yeah, I mean, they've been very successful with Broadcom, the standalone networking company, since they took yeah. it over, right? I mean, it's there's so, a lot of amazing innovation going on there. Yeah, not, not that I'm smiling, I want to kind of poke at this question and see if I get an answer out of you. When you talk to Hock Tan, does he feel like he bought a lot more than he thought? Um, or does he, did he, does he know it's all here? Uh. So, <laughs> the last two months, I mean, they've been going through a very deliberate process yeah. of digging into each business, and certainly he feels like he got a phenomenal asset base. Yeah. He said that to me even today after the keynote, right? It's the amazing amount of uh, product capability that he's seeing in every one of our businesses. And that's been the constant refrain. Well, congratulations I, I, um, on I, that, I've by heard, the way. I've heard Hawk talk about um, the shift to, to mer merchant silicon yeah. from, from custom silicon. I, but I wanted to ask you, when you look at things like AWS Nitro and yeah. Graviton and Tranium and the advantage that AWS has with custom silicon, you see Google and Microsoft sort of Alibaba following suit. Would it benefit you to have custom silicon for, for, for DPU? Um, I mean, I guess you, uh, you know, to have a tighter integration, or do you feel like with the relationships that you have, that doesn't buy you anything? Yeah, I mean, we have pretty strong relationships mm -hmm. with, uh, in fact, fantastic relationships with uh, NVIDIA and Intel and AMD. Pensando you know. and AMD yeah, now. Yeah, right? I mean, we've been working with the Pensando team in their previous right. incarnations for years, right? right? When they were at Cisco. And then same thing with the, uh, we know the Mellanox team, as well as the NVIDIA original teams, and Intel is a collaboration right from the get-go of the company. So we don't feel a need for any of that. We think, I mean, it's clear for those cloud folks, right? They are going towards a vertical integration model in select portions of their stack, like you talked about. Mm. But there is always a room for a horizontal integration model, right? And that's what we are a part of, right? So there'll be a number of DPU vendors, there'll be a number of CPU vendors, uh, there'll be a number of other storage, et cetera, et cetera. And we think that is goodness in an alternative model compared to a vertically integrated And, and yeah, what are, there's trade-offs, right? It's not yeah, exactly. one or the other. I mean, I used to tell, talk to Al Shugart about this all the time, right? I mean, if you're <laughs> vertically integrated, there yourself. may be some cost advantages, but then you've got flexibility advantages if you're using you know, what the industry is building, yeah. right? And those yeah. are the trade-offs, so yeah. yeah. Rega, what are you excited about right now? You got a lot going on, obviously great event. The branding's good, I love the graphics. Um, I was kind of nervous about the name change. I like VMworld, but you know, that's, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> like. It doesn't readily roll off your Yeah, I know, well, I'm just, <laughs> I had a run miscue this morning already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I said VMware Explorer. So you had um, to pay Laura a fine. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, he's the, I get the quarter jar, dollars and the, the curse yeah. jar, whatever yeah. I did wrong. <laughs> no, believe me, only a small mistake. That's because the thing wasn't on. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's on your plate? What's, your, what's some of the milestones? Can you share for your employees, your customers, and your partners out there that are watching that might want to know what's next in the whole Broadcom VMware situation? Is there a timeline? Can you talk publicly about what, to, what people can expect? Yeah, no, we, we talk all the time uh, in the company about that, right? Uh, because uh, even if there is no news, you need to talk about what is where we are, right? Because this is such a big transaction and employees need to know where we are at every minute of the day, right? Yeah. Um, so, so we definitely talk about that. We definitely talk about that with customers too. And where we are is that uh, um, the, all the processes are on track, right? There is a regulatory track going on. And like I alluded to a few minutes ago, Broadcom is doing what they call the discovery phase mm -hmm. of the integration planning, where they learn about the business. And then once that is done, they will figure out what the operating model is. Yeah. What Broadcom has said publicly is that the acquisition will close 
in their fiscal 23, which starts in November of this year, runs through October of next year. So Anywhere it's your that guess okay. as to where it is in that window. All right, Raghu, thank you so much for taking valuable time out of your conference time here for theCUBE. I really appreciate Dave and I both. Appreciate your uh, friendship. You. Congratulations on the success as CEO, because we've been following your trials and tribulations and endeavors for many <laughs> years, and it's been great to chat with you. Yeah, yeah, it's been great to chat with you, not just today, but uh, yeah. over a period of time, yeah. and you guys do great work with this, so. Yeah, and you guys are making, so making all the right calls with VMware. Yeah. All right, more coverage. I'm Sean Furrier, Dave Vellante. CUBE coverage, day one of three days of Walter World coverage here in Moscone West. The CUBE coverage of VMware Explorer 22. We'll be right back. <laughs>